Today we're going to be talking about a subject that I think has been key in the fact that I have dealt with very little pest pressure in my garden overall, that's companion planting. Just to give you a rundown of exactly what we're going to be talking about today, companion planting is a practice that's based on the principle of mutualism. And you can kind of think of mutualism as the opposite of like a parasite, right? And instead of two organisms that work against each other or one that feeds off of the other, it's two that actually help each other to grow symbiotically. This can promote growth, general overall health of the plant, and provide pest control and it can even improve the flavor of plants in some cases and by kind of playing into these strengths of these plants you can create a healthier more resilient garden that requires less intervention and less chemical inputs the goal is to just improve the overall health of your garden by taking advantage of the interaction between certain plant species and there's like six or seven different ways that companion planting can impact your garden so some plants release natural compounds or have a really strong scent that repels different pests Especially with like marigolds, that's one that's very pungent and popular as a companion plant for pest prevention. This works against nematodes, aphids, white flies, even certain types of beetles. Creating kind of a natural barrier with plants like marigolds or basil. Basil is a great one for companion planting with tomatoes because not only does it improve the flavor of your tomatoes, but it can actually help to repel tomato pests like hornworms and white flies. This actually came up in a conversation with one of you recently. I had just been talking about overwintering my carrots and you said that you had major problems with carrot flies on your plants and I realized I've never dealt with this before and it's because I'm planting very aromatic plants like leeks, and chives around those carrots and naturally that's just kept them from appearing at all. I also plant a lot of calendula and yarrow in my garden and both of those are known to attract a wide range of predatory insects which can feed on the pests that you don't want in your garden. They'll attract ladybugs and parasitic wasps. These are things that I just naturally incorporate into my gardens and don't keep in a separate herb garden for the express purpose of supporting the plants that I want to grow. Another way that companion planting can help your garden is in terms of soil health. And there's kind of two different paths that they can do this by. One of these is by having a really long deep tap root. This can loosen compacted soil and it can also mine minerals from lower down than your vegetable plants roots can reach, pulling them to the surface so that it's easier for them to access, which of course is great for the overall health of neighboring plants. So it improves the texture of the soil and it also increases that nutrient content. But another great way to increase the nutrient content is through legumes and other cover crops. Beans, peas, clovers, and alfalfa have this really interesting, unique property where they formed a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria that live on their root nodules. These bacteria take atmospheric nitrogen in the air and they actually convert it into a type of nitrogen that plants can use underground ammonia. So this is called nitrogen fixation and basically it's fixing that nitrogen in the ground so that it's accessible to your plants. You can interplant these, but typically a cover crop is done at the end of a season so that you can reap those benefits the following year. Phytoremediation is a very fancy way of saying a plant cleans the soil. So for example, sunflowers have been used in radioactive areas because they pull that radioactive material up out of the ground and keep it in their plant stock instead. So it's a great way to clean soil in areas where there's heavy metal contamination, lead, arsenic, snake or those radioactive isotopes. Probably my favorite companion plants are dynamic accumulators. This is a plant that particularly mines those minerals from the soil and then after that plant decomposes in place, it returns the minerals to the soil at a level that's much more accessible to plants with shallower root systems. Comfrey in particular is really high in potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. So when that dies back, all those minerals return to the soil in a much more accessible form for the plants. So all of this is about improving soil structure and fertility over time. Probably the most common way that you'll hear companion planting talked about is in terms of space utilization. A great example of this is using a really tall, sturdy plant like a sunflower or corn as a trellis for a vining trailing plant like cucumbers, squash, or even tomatoes. This allows us to maximize the vertical space in the garden that might otherwise be totally unused. This layering approach can also be used with plants that don't necessarily vine upward, but if you have a taller plant, let's say tomatoes for example, you can definitely use the shade that those tomatoes create to grow plants that grow closer to the ground and prefer shade like lettuce. This canopy plus understory combination doesn't just help us conserve space, but it actually helps us conserve water too because those understory plants are kind 
kind of creating a living mulch so it holds the moisture into the soil better, which minimizes the evaporation and it also minimizes weed growth. So you will see many charts online telling you to plant one plant with this plant, this plant with that plant, and I've got one of those too. I'm gonna to link it down below so that you can grab your own copy. I want to encourage you to pay more attention to the key elements that make this system work. There are many different plants that fall into this canopy understory kind of key components that I've been talking about. So you don't need to just stick to like whatever one chart tells you. Use your imagination, get creative with it, and apply some common sense and experiment. And you'll find that a lot of times these plants work symbiotically together in ways you never could have even pictured. You don't need to have everything figured out before you start trying this method. I'm just hoping that this video gives you a kind of base point to start from so that you can make your own decisions and feel empowered to try new things. So by pairing plants with compatible growth habits and shared resource needs, you can really maximize this space, especially when it comes to succession planting. Another great example of this is in my garden beds, I have probably 200 cloves of garlic growing, and that's a lot of space to take up in my garden. But you can plant other things in between your garlic plants as long as they have a shallow root structure. So where we've got something with a really deep root structure, we wanna make sure that whatever we're interplanting with that garlic has a shallow root structure that's not gonna choke it out. And so I typically do something like herbs. I've got chamomile, I've got calendula growing in with my garlic this year. And these do great together without overcrowding or stunting growth. If you're interested in the soil health element of it, interplanting beans with something that's a heavy feeder like corn and squash is going to give you better results while maintaining that space utilization that we've been talking about. This comes into play a lot with the three sisters method, which is interplanting corn, squash, and beans together. Another great way that you can utilize companion planting to increase yield is by pairing plants that require cross-pollination. So of course, bees and other pollinators are attracted to a very diverse amount of flowers. So anytime you can be incorporating those native plants that are flowering into your garden, it's going to help benefit your veggies too, especially for crops like tomatoes tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers. A few of my favorites to incorporate for cross-pollination are lavender, forage, sunflowers, cosmos, and bee balm. They're all known for their prolific blooms and you will always see tons of pollinators on all of these plants. I will leave you with one word of warning and that is that some plants really do not get along. This can be due to competition for resources, but it can also be due to the fact that those plants release compounds that are allopathic, which means they are inhibiting the growth of other plants. Now, this is something that's way more common in weeds and invasive species than within the family of vegetable plants that you're most likely growing, but it's something to keep in mind. Many plant combinations offer synergistic benefits, but it's important to realize that not all of them are gonna have positive outcomes. A really common example of this is black walnuts. They release a compound into the soil that inhibits the growth of many vegetable plants, including tomatoes, peppers, and potatoes. So if you end up planting your vegetables next to a black walnut tree, you're going to notice stunted growth, yellowing leaves, and just overall poor yield. Planting certain combinations of plants together can also increase the likelihood of disease is spreading. This is especially true in the case of tomatoes and potatoes. Planting those close together can create a breeding ground for potato blight. Because those plants are in the same family and they share the same diseases, it's better to give them a little bit more space. All right, friends, that's all that I have for you today on companion planting. Make sure you grab the chart that I'm going to link down below. Thank you so much for gardening with me and happy growing.